<laughs> Hello and welcome to this week's episode of the podcast thing. Still haven't decided the name really, just going with it. Um, I've got Rowan, I've dragged him out of his uh, Loughborough seminar. Um, he has found a white wall um, with a really bright light to show his tan um, and he's sat in front of it. So today, how are you Rowan, you okay? I'm very well, thank you. <clears throat> Good man. Uh, God, yeah, been a, been a long week already. Been a long week. Every so weekend. Every Thursday, yeah. Um, nearly Christmas, mate. Um, so today we're going to get stuck into it. So we are going to be talking about lagging body parts. So everyone, uh, well, I say everyone, most people will admit they have that one body part that they struggle with. And normally, if you listen to that, this, sorry, it's probably, it's not as big as any other muscle in your body. Um, so today we're going to talk about how you can potentially get that muscle better, bring up that lagging body part, um, and really kind of change your physique for the better. Because normally we're a little bit insecure about these body parts. Um, I'll say what mine is. So mine is my P, no, it's not that, it is my <laughs> arms. <laughs> um, so my biceps and triceps are my quote unquote lagging body parts. I could probably throw calves in there as well, but everyone says calves. So that's a bit of a cop out. Um, <laughs> don't win bodybuilding shows with your calves. Probably do. Um, but yeah, we're going to talk about that today, but um, I'm just going to do a little update from both of us first. Are you ready for an update, Rowan, on yourself? Think so. I think Put you on so. the spot. Over to you, mate. Oh, God. I thought you were going to go first. So, it's my um, podcast, mate. I'll, do, I'll put you on the spot. You do whatever you want. You yeah. <laughs> so, just back into, at least training wise, just back into uh, my next block after taking a very, very well needed deload week. Good. So, I reached the uh, top end of volume that I could recover from, slash, not fully recover from um pushed it one more week through adding in a couple of intensifiers on a couple of exercises Good. and by the end of that week i was a, a shell of a man Trash. i was ready for that rest <laughs> and it was it's probably the first time i've ever fully accepted i needed a deal apart from I, lockdown two where we were just in the garage well, true but we didn't deload <laughs> then did we we just trained oh, not at all no, just more, more squats and more dead, deadlifts. Oh, I miss it. Oh, RIP that gym, mate. <laughs> <laughs> um, so you yeah. had, you increased volume across the meso, didn't you? And that's the first yeah. time you've done it. Um, so what yeah. are your thoughts on it? How, are you, how did you feel about it? What were your experiences of it? Because before you were very much a kind of, quote unquote, J, JP style. Two sets, one top set all out, one back off set potentially all out as well. Um, and obviously we kind of read, a, we were listening to different names in the industry because um, that's what we do. Um, we listened to both sides of like the volume argument and the intensity argument. And you were the first one to try it on yourself because obviously I was coming from prep. So I wasn't in the best place to yeah. be around for volume. Um, so what were your experience of it? Like obviously first time round. So I think it's, First off, something I wouldn't ever implement someone that was possibly in a deficit. I don't think the increase in volume and increase in demand is worth going about it. And Definitely. time, because you said, because yes. I'll, ju I'll jump in as well. Okay. I have just about felt okay to increase volume for the, this week. So I have added a set to most things, kind of like Rowan did at the end of his meso. So I'm coming towards the end of a meso cycle now. Probably got about one or maybe two more weeks until the deload. So I thought I'm feeling good. Um, I don't feel like I'm dying. So let's put in a little bit more volume and see what's happening. And the sessions are long. Like I'm a motivated person. Like don't have to tell me to get motivated for the gym. However, when you're doing like four or five sets, <laughs> um, it, it can, I don't know how you felt on that, like, but I, I was almost like, almost kind of rushing my rest times because I was like, Christ, oh, like I was getting time anxiety because I was like, I've got a call in a minute with a client. Am I going to make it? Because I've got 17 more sets of lateral races. <laughs> yeah, so I was, t 
typically training first thing in the morning before lectures and I started noticing I was running up really close to just as they were about to begin because sessions were taking two hours to finish mm. and because I started my kind of baseline volume with two sets both to failure then increasing set numbers still to failure as well yeah rest time was taking a huge hit to try and rush through them so I think it's a good strategy if you have the time of eating enough the other thing I would say is that it did massively impact on the rest of my day mm. I was so fatigued especially after some like the lower body sessions I would do the session go to a lecture get home I already would have eaten two three times I would just sit there and just crash out by one in the afternoon yeah so do, you think, most... do you think the level of fatigue obviously you're a little bit different because you're taking every set to failure pretty much or yeah. there and thereabouts. So I'm doing it a little bit differently. So I'm kind of going like top set for the first set, which I will go to failure. And then depending on the set number afterwards, so whether it's two sets afterwards, so potentially two back offs, I'll gradually transition away from failure on those because obviously I'm not in a kind of deep in the off season like Rowan. So I do not have the recovery. So I'm not necessarily feeling that beaten up as compared to when I did like top set back off all out. Um, yeah. I don't know whether that's because just because I'm not as strong as when I was like peak, peak weight, um, which I probably think it is. Um, but yeah, I just think it's a really interesting approach. And like, I think we'll keep talking about our experiences of this on the pod because um, it'll be interesting. And like, however, what I will say is I, I got from the sessions, I've only done two higher volume sessions so far um i am getting more doms obviously well not obviously but i'm getting more delayed onset muscle for soreness which obviously isn't the be all and end all however i do struggle with doms in my weaker body parts like we'll talk about in a minute um but for the first time this week i've been able to kind of actually feel them the next day which is quite a good feeling um and the pump in the session um was also something that i noticed in body parts that i've struggled to connect with before so maybe okay. kind of when we spoke about on the volume kind of training setting up a, a bulk and the volume side of things like if you're an intermediate or a beginner you might need more volume because your accuracy is slightly off maybe that's applying to my weaker body parts because my accuracy is slightly off that little bit it, well that increase in volume gives me more time to actually fatigue them because say I do 15 reps, six of them are shit um, or six of them I'm not connecting with. Um, the other kind of, I don't know, quick math. I don't know how many I'd do. The other six are good, but if I have that extra set, it's six more kind of effective reps. Um, so that's something I'm kind of yeah. thinking and thinking about on my walks at the moment because um, it's quite an interesting topic for me. Um, little update on me. So what am I up to? I gained some weight, which is good. Um, I'm around 92 oh. kilograms now, so that's about five kilograms, five to six kilograms up on stage. Um, my well, my lowest weight from prep, which is good. Um, I would, yesterday I was going to do a story about it. it. Was the first day I felt full and had zero food focus. So after every meal since since my show, I have been starving. And I would instantly be thinking about the next meal. But yesterday was the first time that I actually sat there and thought, this is what full feels like, um, which is quite strange. And it's made me really content in, in that sense, because like anyone who's dieted quite a lot, well, quite aggressively knows what it feels like to be hungry. And it's not a nice feeling. So I'm looking forward to that. I'm just waiting for kind of the rest of my bodily functions to kick in, if you know what I mean. Um, but that, I think that will be a little bit longer. Um, I'm going through some external stress at the moment. So that's always going to play a factor in obviously more of your subjective measures and your biofeedback because um, you cannot separate this bodybuilding malarkey from general life stress. So hopefully that will iron out um, and I am on the road to getting jacked and tanned. Um, I'm already tanned, just not jacked. <laughs> Still got to we I'm jacked, but not tanned debatable uh, right i am 
I am eight weeks post show, and I am the same weight as Rowan. Let's put that in perspective. <laughs> but weak as fuck. Right. Concentrate. Um, this is not just a bro chat. Um, right. Let's go to the topic of the video. So, topic of the video is lagging body parts, weaker body parts, smaller body parts. Every client I ever speak with on their initial consultation call will probably say, I want to bring up so and this. I want to bring up that. And I, I often kind of ask them, why is that? And they say, oh, I think it's a lagging body part or I think it's not as big as everywhere else in my body. So we thought it would be good kind of discussion to talk about it um, from like a training standpoint, from a nutritional standpoint, um, and from a programming standpoint, because I think the programming side of things, there's a, there's a, there can be a lot going on with programming. Um, sometimes it can be very simple. Um, sometimes it can be a little bit more complex, depending on where you're at in your journey. Um, but then also we're going to dive into a little bit of kind of mechanics um, and movement, because I would argue, and I will argue, um, that in more cases than not, the, mu the muscles that are weak are the ones that we can't connect with very well. And that will normally come from kind of a biomechanical issue, issue in quotation marks, because it's not really an issue, but it is if we want to grow that muscle. So let's start with, what should we start with? Let's start with programming. So you've got a client, let's create an avatar. His name's Jackson Tand. Um, and he wants to grow his, what should we say, arms or legs? Because they're the two common ones. Uh, let's go. Legs. Let's go on. So this client wants to grow their legs. They have been lifting for a couple of years. They're in decent shape. Every, like they, they're in good nick. Um, where would you start? So... First thing is, for me personally, exercise selection. I think that's the biggest factor for setting up everything. Like, there's no point doing more if what you're doing in the first place isn't fully working. Very good. Um, which, again, the, I think the biggest hot topic is, do I need to squat, a back squat, front squat, some sort of barbell squat movement, to maximize my leg gains because I know it's we're different in that you think you've gotten quite a lot out of squatting whereas I think my squatting for years hasn't has grown my erectors in the glutes but it's not grown my quads yeah and I think this already pulls in kind of biomechanics side of things if you look at me and Rome we're very similar in how we look like we stand next to each other about the same height about the same build like um muscle mass probably there or thereabouts like I'm probably a little bit more lower body heavy than you um yeah. and you're a lot more kind of sh shoulder and arm dominant and I might have a little actually yeah. yeah I think you've got a bigger upper body in general probably um but when you see a squat there's a big difference okay and that's just from the movement patterns that we've learned from when we first squatted okay and of yeah. course well you have like the social aspect of lifting which is like Rowan got taught to lift by someone who didn't know, potentially, I'm just making this up, or he taught himself and fell into quote unquote different habits to what I did. So in terms of the squat, I learned and developed a very kind of, what's the word? Neat looking high bar squat. Um, and with the high bar squat, I'm getting a lot of knee flexion, very little kind of um, flexion at the hip. Um, so that my quads are getting absolutely taxed throughout that movement. Whereas Rowan is a lot more hip dominant. Could be for a number of reasons. Let's say our avatar has tight muscles around the hips or tight muscles around the knee that limit his mobility in that squat pattern. And that might force him into a more hip dominant squat. And if we're in a more hip dominant squat, that will limit the talk and the tension and and then subsequently kind of the actual work that we can get through the quads and therefore all of those years like Rowan said all of those years of thinking what well, I need to squat for legs has actually meant he's missed out or missed out on a lot of time of effective training because 
that's where you said exercise selection comes in. And I know that you would straight away start thinking like me that we should be looking for stability and a way of creating um, less hip flexion and extension and more knee flexion and extension. Because really, if we're trying to grow our legs, um, we're thinking about the quads mainly. Um, hamstrings is a different story because we'd be looking at like a hip hinge or potentially more machines again and thinking how can we actually get this client initiating the squat with knee, knee travel that's a, that's a cue that i use quite a lot with clients in consults and kind of form analysis on our on our check-ins is a lot of people initiate the squat and i know rowan used to do this by shifting their hips back and if you're initiating a movement with <sighs> a joint that's controlled by different muscles than the muscle you want to potentially challenge in that movement, you're always setting yourself up for kind of a battle because that, that initial movement is always going to be the dominant from the rest of the movement is then always going to be the dominant kind of what's the word um, motion in that movement or that squat pattern. So if the client is shifting their hips back, it's already going to be a hip dominant squat. Whereas if they start thinking knees forward and staying nice and upright, we're already placing a demand through the quads. Um, and sometimes, like you said, from a, from a programming standpoint, we need to relearn, reset movements. Yeah. And you did that with your squats, didn't you? In the garage of dreams. Yeah. <laughs> I think that's, yeah, I think that's quite a good point is if you're looking to reset a movement, let's sort of say it was a back squat, for example, a lot of the time, if I was using myself as an example, I could shift more weight than potentially my form justified. Yes. Like I could get the weight up, but it was going to be hips or lower back. If I was then to reset and relearn that movement, it's down to reducing load, practicing that technique, and then possibly moving it later in the session where possibly the legs are already slightly fatigued through other machine work or stable movements, whereby you can use a lighter load your back and uh, core and stability aspects should still be intact. But at least your quads are already in a position to start working slightly harder. Mm. And I mean, resetting is hard because we all know, we're all married to progressive overload and there's something innately wrong about knowing that you can lift heavier, but then not lifting that weight. Um, and this is something that I'm doing with my pushing movements at the moment and all of my arm training because they're areas that I see as weak. Um, and it's tough. Part of it is the mental battle because we're all egotistical people. Everyone has an ego just chipping away at the back saying you weak little boy or girl. Um, so yeah, I think the resetting thing is a massive one. Obviously in terms of exercise selection and program design, like, I'll always argue with a client, unless you've got an immaculate squat and, un, and limited gym equipment, I would probably not have you squatting from a fatigue, fatigue management point of view. Um, unless, like I said again, unless you are Keefe, um, Keefe West, I, I just think it asks too much of natural lifters when you get, to, when you get quite strong, okay? So from anecdotal experience and from client experience, when you get kind of squatting around 190 for reps, it's, it's hard. And that, like, no amount of food that you're going to eat and really no amount of normal sleep is going to mitigate that fatigue. Um, and it's a kind of risk to, not a risk to reward, it's like a trade-off, isn't it? Like, you have this total amount of volume that you can use, but things like deadlift squats, I think potentially use up a little bit more because they're not just, they're not just a quad isolation, are they? 
in any in any shape or form they are erectors glutes hamstrings are being eccentrically loaded calves like a ro rotator cuffs neck brain soul everything is just taking a volume hit and you've got to factor that in so it will always be the case of not arguing with a client but po like positioning you could do a squat or you could do something like a pendulum or a hack squat or a v squat or a Smith machine squat where we're taking out some of those things that might limit the effect of the effectiveness of that movement. So for example, Smith machine squat, I would program a Smith machine squat, squat for a lot of people used it with myself. And I know you've had a great run with it before. Yep. It removes the stability aspect of it and it allows you to manipulate um, kind of the profile of the exercise because obviously it's fixed. With a barbell, you have no ability, with a free weight barbell that is, you have no ability to kind of change your foot position because obviously gravity is real. So if you did that, you would just fall back and you'd have 190 kilograms slamming you down. Um, but with a Smith machine and machine, you have the ability to kind of change where your feet are. And therefore you're starting to individualize each move, movement for the person who's doing it. Um, which is something like you said for program design and exercise selection is massive because if someone is very hip dominant like you, um, we could put you on a hack squat where you literally cannot be hip dominant because your hips cannot move. Yeah. Same with a pendulum squat. In some, in some instances, same with a Smith machine squat. If you shift your feet forward, it will be very unnatural and very hard for you to actually load your hips compared to a barbell squat. So that's where kind of exercise selection is massive. From a volume point of view, what would you be thinking? So once we've got the movement that the person connects with, likes, and is able to start feeling that if we're still, still, still sticking with legs, can feel their quads working, a baseline volume, I would probably say, is at least twice a week or possibly every four to five days. Um, at least that's a safe position where they're getting frequent work in. And if they are trying to relearn the squat pattern, doing it slightly more frequently is probably going to be more beneficial to getting the new movement ingrained in them rather than squat on Mondays, wait another full seven days to do it again. If you look at it within a year's period, rather than squatting 52 times, you get to squat 104 times. Mm. In theory. Even on Christmas much. Day, mother. Working hard on that. No well, days well. off. Hustle, hustle. Um, yes, I would agree. I think, especially with, like I said, body parts that you feel are lagging, you're probably not going to be the best at training them. So, you don't want to just ramp up volume until you warrant it. Um, and by warranting it, I would say feeling it in the muscles that you're meant to feel it in, um, recovering from the, from the, the work that you're actually doing um, and recovering from the frequency. Sometimes higher frequency can work, but again, it depends on which, which body part that is. Potentially leg training, it's, it's hard because it's such a big muscle group and very often needs increased loads. So it's not just as simple as, ah, oh, on my push day, I can do a set of leg press. It's not that simple. Whereas if you were trying to bring up your arms, you could potentially drop in sets here and there. For example, you could do arms on leg day. You could do arms, well, pretty much every day. As long as it's not taking away from your the main body of work, you could pretty much get arms in anywhere. So volume, I think, once you warrant an increase, you can look at increasing volume. Um, but again, don't just be sucked into kind of doing junk volume, which is something I have been guilty of in the past. So like I said at the start, my areas that I've always wanted to bring up in my arms, just because being like an albatross, I'm just a long boy. Um, it, I thought just doing more would be the case. Um, so I was doing like four sets on the most days, like I just said, and they didn't grow. Um, and, I, and I kind of credit that to, well, they grew a little bit, but I credit that to, to kind of 
poor execution and just junk volume. Like, and again, linking back to that mechanic side of things, like, was I training them well? Like, was that what I was doing actually challenging what I was trying to challenge? Or was it just me moving my arm around for very little stimulus? Um, so again, you really need to reverse engineer things. If you're doing full sets of curls already, trying to grow your arms and they're not growing, something's not right there because four sets should be adequate in a workout session, probably a little bit more across the week. But that's really interesting on how you'd approach programming. What would you be thinking about from a nutritional standpoint then? Obviously, it's probably less of a immediate thing that you're going to be like, yeah. our, main effort, our main effort is going to be with the, with the training side of things. But of yes. course, we need to be supporting that training with adequate nutrition and appropriate nutrition. Yeah, so it's one of the interesting factors is training itself is the kind of main stimulus to grow. Like that will enhance that period of muscle protein synthesis, which everyone loves to throw out. It's basically just MPS, the, MPS. the process at which your body starts kind of accruing new tissue. But if you're then not consuming the protein, your body has some pretty fun features that basically say, you know what, if we don't have the energy, we're not going to do anything. We're not going to grow. So hitting kind of equal servings of protein throughout the day, decent amount of calories around it, you've got to have to accept if you want these lacking parts to grow, you're going to have to start eating a little bit more. Otherwise, they're just not going to stay. They're not going to grow. So I think like push-ups definitely help this. Um, especially for natty guys or girls, um, you've got to get a little bit uncomfortable in these growth phases because there's a lot, like we've already spoken about, there's a lot of reasons why those body parts aren't growing um, and you do not want one of those to be your decision not to get fluffy <laughs> um, because that's completely in your control. Like a biomechanical issue or a genetic issue is potentially less in your control, but you not hitting your protein servings across the day to mitigate MPS, you not being in a decent enough calorie surplus to progress body weight is completely in your court. Um, and it can be hard sometimes because like, it's not nice walking around like a little bit fluffier than, than you'd like and seeing it in your face. Like I love having a leaner face from show. Like if I could stay like this forever, I would, but I know at some point I'm just gonna be walking around like a thumb. Um, I've, just, I've just accepted my chin's gone. Yeah, but you've got a beard. It's just going to get worse. I've got Movember looking like um some little pedo over here. Like um, a Burt Reynolds wannabe. <laughs> <laughs> bum's dead. Bum's dead. Um, <laughs> yeah, so I think like from a nutritional side of things, the protein serving is probably the most important thing if we're, we're, we're accepting that calories are high enough. You want to be in that positive nitrogen balance. Make sure you're spreading that protein across the day not taking the absolute biscuit with it and having like 20 servings of protein. Um, but minimum three, I would always say potentially minimum, maybe even four, if you're a bigger guy, because we don't want to be having more than kind of 50 grams per serving because then we don't, I think we oxidize it or something like that. We don't actually use you, it. So you'll still absorb all of it, but yeah. at least there's a, a massive diminishing return kind of, after 40, definitely 50 grams. In terms of hypertrophy. Uh, yeah, or at least how much protein protein synthesis gets spiked. Or you basically, it just won't start increasing. Otherwise, okay. people will just so if you're a bigger, 100 grams at the time. Yeah, if you're a bigger guy, I would, I, I would even say like three is too little because that would mean you'd have to be getting like 65 grams per meal. Um, Every and four hours. Yeah, and, it, and I, I just wouldn't think that would be good. Like I'd always say like four or five um, minimum um, from a protein serving standpoint. And also in like a gaining phase where you're trying to bring up these lagging body parts, that will also help with total calories because you'll be able, it's just more opportunities for you to eat, um, which is something that clients need to work on because it is that time of year where food's going up and you've got to eat your calories or else you're not going to grow. So what have we talked about? We've talked about programming. We've talked about uh, volume. We've spoken about nutrition a bit, which is good. Um, what would you be thinking about in terms of recovery for these body parts? So 
I can go on this one because I've got something in the front of my head. If you want. Uh, I'll let you go first. Then I'll, I, I think then I'll I would also argue, this is just anecdotal evidence again, that these lagging body parts often um, are located in areas where we have recurring niggles. Um, and by niggles, I would say slight pains and kind of those things that you know when you get tired or you haven't had a rest for ages, you'll start to feel it. For me, it's kind of pec tendon in here and a little bit of kind of elbow tendonitis. And there's no research on this that I know of, but this is just kind of me thinking on my feet. I'm always trying to grow my arms. And like I said, and my chest. So for me, I know when I am kind of potentially just generally overreaching or training in a less effective manner because I'll start to pick up that those niggles, the recurring niggles. So my tendonitis will start to flare up in my chest. My I will start to kind of, I don't know if it's golfer's elbow or tennis elbow, but I'll start to be feeling my joints and they'll feel creaky. And for me and some of my clients, that's something that we'll, we will track and I'll ask them, have you got any kind of niggles that you you know you get frequently? And we'll manage, we'll tr track them. And I'll ask them near the end of a mesocycle, like how are those body parts feeling? Because again, normally, because I'm trying to support the client in what they want to achieve, there'll probably be a bit more volume through those body parts because they're the ones they want to grow. So watching out for niggles and accepting they might come in at the end of a mesocycle but then knowing right this is a sign for a deload because niggles can then lead to yeah like long-term injuries and no one wants that because you know what's really not good for a lagging body part not being able to train the joint at all <laughs> <laughs> so that's actually quite a good point so thanks mate I'm I, yeah you're welcome <laughs> so my legs have always been a slightly slower body parts grow obviously because of hip back etc one issue <laughs> i've always found is having tighter quads having tighter hips and definitely struggling getting into those deeper like knee flexion movements so ever since i've accepted that i need to drop load on things i need to change into movements that are more supported where i can try and emphasize um, knee movement over the toes to try and like, maximize um, knee flexion and extension. Ironically, my hips have felt better. My quads are still pretty tight, but I don't have an issue. So at the moment, all of my squatting movements are on uh, either like a hack squat, kind of like a true squat variation, where at least I don't have to worry about supporting a bar on my back. And if you saw me, Alex, you would be proud of that depth. It's beautiful. So that's my the first point. The second point was that was something else I noticed. At the end of that mesocycle, I was noticing kind of niggles in my shoulders and things. So I think just the sheer volume of lateral raises and things that I was doing, that I was ready to take that deload because it was niggles that I've not had, or at least I've not had them in my shoulders before. My tendonitis from lockdown started flaring back up. And I think it's important paying attention to those biofeedback and realising, okay, it is time to take a bit of a rest. 100%, yeah. And I think like, that's where biofeedback is so important and kind of understanding where you struggled in the past and where you might continue to struggle and just being realistic with that. Um, we'd all love to be kind of like Superman, Iron Man, like never get any problems. But the realization is that most of us probably come from a sport, some form of sporting background. Um, and life happens, like we get niggles and we don't always start with great form. So we've probably built and compounded on these issues for a long period of time. So, yeah, I think it is a good point, mate. Thanks, thanks for bringing. Thanks for telling me that was a good point. I just need to find a research paper that actually proves it now. Um, and I'll be, a, and I'll be the Einstein of the muscle building world. Um, well, as a, as a co-author myself, uh, I validate your theory. Thank you. Yeah, we just need to <laughs> triple blind mice trial it for a bit. Find a mice mm. with some small arms and see if they can get jacked. Easy. Um, <laughs> so we talked, talked, spoken about. 
exercise selection, programming, volume, nutrition, recovery. Now let's talk about mechanics and, and execution. So I know we spoke a bit, a little bit about kind of resetting movements, but I think there is a great deal of kind of, well, there's a big argument that muscles that are poor in terms of how they look or most of the time their size are ones that we really struggle to connect with um, generally and in training. Um, and a lot of the time, I do think that is down to a kind of biomechanical deficiency, um, which sounds a little bit more scary than it is. Um, it just basically means something's not clicking in the way you move that that stops you. I wasn't I wasn't frozen then. I just I was, ser I was searching my very words so hard <laughs> for a word. Um, it just means that we we struggle a lot with contracting or setting up our body to contract that muscle, and a lot of the time it's not something that's going to get ironed out quickly. And like we said, with the resetting thing, it can be a very tedious experience. And what you need to do is re reverse engineer and go back to the foundations of what you are trying to achieve with the movement that you are doing. So you are doing a movement, but you're not just doing a movement. You're doing a movement to challenge a specific muscle. So therefore you must think, what is this muscle responsible for? Because if in the movement you're doing something that that muscle is not responsible for, you're, you're displacing that work. And I see that a lot and I see it myself, which is the most annoying thing. In most of my pressing, I displace everything through my shoulders. That's why if you follow me on Instagram, you will see that I've fully reset all of my pressing. So that means for me, I have my feet up, um, I'm almost doing like an ab crunch um, throughout the lift. So that means I'm not, a, I'm go, not going through kind of a huge extension and it's allowing me to really just focus on what my chest is doing. I was getting caught up or way caught up, way too caught up in leg drive, arch and shifting tin um, as opposed to, right, is my humerus driving across my midline of my body? because that's the fundamental of what my chest should be doing during any press. And when I regressed it back, I actually found like, was my chest actually doing a lot of the work? No. Was I kind of doing like a weird hip thrust shoulder tricep extension to get those fifties up? Yes. And now I've gone back to all of my pressing is paused. All of my pressing, like I said, is feet up. Um, and all of my pressing doesn't have that excessive kind of, um, back arch because remember we're not training movements we're training muscles so by regressing it back um you really can kind of tap into true progress as opposed to kind of more movement-based progress where you get really good at just doing a movement with very little regard to the extent the internal stimulus you get from it and we're all guilty of that like i can throw around the well not right now but i can throw around the 50s like anyone but has it resulted in me getting a bigger chest a little bit, but not as much as it could do um, relative to kind of my body weight and my size. So I don't know what you think about that because I'm just, I'm very passionate about that one. <laughs> no, I think that's very true, especially um, there's a page on Instagram called Squat University, especially for obviously anything related to the squat pattern. A lot of people um, are almost scared to allow their knees to track over their toes or that is the worst myth. Whoever like, created like, that, whoever created that, myth, awful. I don't know where it's come from because actually healthy knees, the health, the people like knees over toes guy. Have you heard of him? Yeah. Like he's just like, he has just proven that the healthiest knees um, go way over their toes and are strong in that yeah. position as well. And I learned that from rehab, actually not drug rehab, but knee rehab. Um, so yeah, sorry, mate, but I didn't know. Uh, that's okay. Um, and I think because of that, people haven't accepted the way that their body actually moves. So at least um, the same page posted a quite good screening technique for a how far your knee can move whilst in a kind of the bottom of a squat position. Mm -hmm. And then from that, what angle your knee needs to be at or your femur needs to be at 
in order to maximize the amount of flexion you kind of get at the hip. So if you're lying flat on the floor, one leg completely straight, bend one knee, bring it up to your chest. If it starts, if it can touch your chest perfect, you're lucky. Because where your the kind of head of your femur sits in your hip will differ from person to person. Exactly. Someone may have the head kind of completely within the kind of femur, uh, sorry, hip girdle. And then they can't bring their knee up in a straight line. They've got to have it flared out to the side to be able to get full knee flexion extension. I think it's testing those kind of movements and accepting, okay, I need to have my knees actually flared out to be able mm -hmm. to move is quite a good point to accept rather than, yeah. what, if you look at a lot of the Chinese weightlifters, their knees are like that but their back is then perfectly straight up and down. Perfect high bar knee flexion. And again, like, I think that's a great point. Like we're all individuals and our, none of our bodies are the same unless you're an identical twin. So no. you can take nuggets from people who have good form in those, those areas that you want to develop your form in. But at the end of the day, you are completely different to them. Like Rowan could look at my squat and be like, oh, I want to squat like him, but it's never going to work exactly the same. Like he can take nuggets and he can listen to me, but at the end of the day, it will be kind of, it's more of a journey of finding what works for you. And clearly if you've got a lagging body part, what you've been doing doesn't work. And I think where possible, I do think kind of getting some unilateral work in there will really help you again it will add to your session length like i've got lots of unilateral work at the moment and it is a bit tedious at the times because you just want to get them both done at the same time however i am finding that the connection i can create with the muscle that i'm trying to work is way better because i literally have my soul it is my sole focus is that arm or that leg or that obviously i can't do it with chest as well but you get what i mean it's allowing me to direct my intent to that muscle um and and likewise if you're doing unilateral work on kind of limbs you can support that working limb with the other limb um, which i think can work in both the stability side of things so for example with tricep extensions i will often brace against my my other arm um and can also support with kind of spotting and force reps which will help potentially develop intensity in areas that you might struggle with because like i said yeah sorry you can i think that. that's quite an interesting point actually another um, one another a lot of <laughs> i need to stop saying this so a lot of my back movement now are typically unilateral because mm. i find that i can get a much better movement pattern if i can move individually versus trying to control both at once 100 percent. as well there's like there's finer points where like your lap can tip you down to one side as well lateral but if you're trying to exactly but well, i'm not going technical but if you're doing it on both sides you can't suddenly like exactly yeah. sit there with your elbows here both like, it doesn't time. work and that's and that's what you mean like you need to regress the movement or the pattern back to its essence and really tap into that um a little bit different can kind of chest because you get a little bit lopsided and you probably fall over, but um, back movements, hundred percent arm movements and leg movements. Like I've moved most of my kind of, well, at least across my training block or training rotation, I will have unilateral work for all limbs. So that's bicep, triceps, hamstrings and quads. Um, I will challenge them unilaterally because I know I've got imbalances um, from getting pretty lean on stage i know that one side is bigger than the other for whatever reason but i need to address that um so that's where like both of us use needs analysis is with our clients um knowing what you need to develop planning for it so mate i think we've covered a lot there i think we smashed it yes considering we literally didn't have a topic about 45 minutes ago i think we've done all right so <laughs> If you have any questions about this, um, let us know. Um, our details will be in the uh, box below if you want to contact us. If you have any ideas for topics, just give one of us a message. But once again, thank you, buddy. Pleasure having you on. Pleasure. Um, thank you. And we will be back very, very soon.